Welcome, my name is Laura Winnie. I'm the Curator of Education here at Heritage Village. Welcome to the first series, uh, part two, for Speaking of History with Gail McDonald, and I'll introduce her in just a second. And also, I want to thank PCHS, the Pinellas County Historical Society, for sponsoring so many wonderful events here at Heritage Village. Joining this organization, you help Heritage Village and beyond. So if you are interested in joining, there are membership applications there at the back table. And I think we have a few PCHS board members in the audience today. Do we got a few? Raise your hand. So if you have any questions about PCHS, you can ask one of those people that grudgingly raised their hand when I called them out, OK? <laughs> All right, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Gail McDonald who has come to talk to us about Morton F. Plant, son of Henry Plant. She is a veteran journalist from Connecticut and is currently an associate professor at the University of Connecticut. Now, you may be wondering, OK, how does that connect Morton F. Plant, Connecticut? Well, at, from the research in her book, she learned a lot about his philanthropy, both on the Connecticut shoreline and down here in Florida. And in fact, Gail has a very interesting connection to Morton F. Plant. Currently, she lives on Plant Street in, um, sorry, New London. And Plant, that was the location for his baseball field, because he did own a minor league baseball team. So fun little personal connection with Morton F. Plant. And I hope everybody will join me in welcoming Gail McDonald. <laughs> Take it away. Well, thank you very much for coming out today. And I do have a teacher voice because uh, that's my other profession. And I like to say I'm a veteran journalist because it sounds a lot nicer than saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to talk uh, about Morton Plant today and his contributions um, to, and the book is called Connecticut Shoreline because he did have uh, a lot of um, focus on that area and a lot of impact on that area. But as you'll see as I, I talk about him, he also had a lot of impact down here along with his father, who you probably know a lot more about, um, is Henry uh, Plant. So <clears throat> he traded his New York City townhouse to famed jeweler Cartier for a $1 million string of pearls that has, had caught his wife's eyes. He cemented the success of a new women's college in New London, Connecticut, with a $1 million donation that allowed him to end a board of trustees meeting and go watch his baseball team play. <laughs> After his son was injured in an automobile accident and he couldn't find suitable health, local health care in the Clearwater area, he pledged enough money to make possible the establishment of the hospital that still bears his name. In 1908, he spent the equivalent of more than $24 million in today's dollars to build a yacht upon which he would spend nine months. It required a crew of skilled and non-skilled workers who would see global sites, few members of the American working class of that generation had experienced, and earning some of them 10 times the average pay of that day. Morton F. Plant enjoyed the wealth that was largely amassed by his father. He played hard, he spent lavishly, he also gave back to the community in ways that long endeared him to the locals in his hometowns and still has an impact a century past his death. So 1852 was the year that Morton was 
but was born. And um, 1868 was the year that he went into his professional life. He did not go to college. He went into business with his father, Henry Bradley Plant. Um, and Henry put, uh, put him in charge of the Southern Express Company uh, out in Nashville, Tennessee. So as you can see by the date, it was only a few years after the end of the Civil War, and the South was still quite decimated at that time. So you get a good sense of what he got into. Um, the Southern Express Company was like the FedEx of its day. They delivered goods over the railroads, uh, largely owned by Henry. So uh, these are two scenes from where uh, Morton was born. He was born in Bramford, Connecticut, and his father, Henry Plant, was also born in Bramford, Connecticut. It's a shoreline town. It's uh, fairly small. Um, but at that point, it was starting to become a place where people were coming in the summertime for, to spend some leisure. There was an emerging middle class, and people were starting to get some time off, and there was also transportation that was starting to develop that would allow people to go to the shore for a day. So these are uh, some scenes of what it would have been like when Morton was growing up in Bramford. In 1900, I use this date because um, in 1899, Henry Bradley Plant died. And really, um, Morton Plant didn't come into his own until after his father's death. Uh, his father really uh, was, as I said, the person who, who made the money. He made the family's fortune. And he was, there was a lot of evidence that he wasn't particularly impressed with his son's um, business acumen or, and had some skepticism about uh, how his son was going to really uh, do as uh, the head of this empire that he had built. But in 1900, uh, Morton and Henry's widow won a lawsuit overturning Henry's will. Um, Henry did not give all his estate to his widow and his son. Uh, Morton was his only son. Um, he actually wanted it to skip a generation and his money to go to his grandson, um, who at that time was only an infant. Um, but uh, his, uh, Morton and his widow were able to get that overturned, and they inherited the fortune uh, between them. So this is a little bit of what it was like in America in 1900, which is really when, from his mid-40s on, that Morton ma started making a name for himself. Uh, like a lot of wealthy industrialists of the time, Morton kept a townhouse in New York City. And it was a time of a great disparity in terms of um, the, the top of the, of the socioeconomic classes and the bottom. Um, so Morton certainly knew and saw what the poor uh, in New York City, how they lived. Um, and these are a couple of pictures that depict that. Uh, but this was the neighborhood where Morton lived. And his neighbors were the Vanderbilts and the Astors and all those, a lot of the names that we're very familiar with from the Gilded Age that had made uh, fortunes in oil and railroads and banking and um, all those other kinds of, of industries that made people very wealthy. So Midtown Manhattan at that time was, you know, obviously a lot cleaner, um, a lot more, uh, a lot less noisy, <laughs> um, and uh, a lot, lot more pleasant place to be. Uh, Morton's house had a townhouse at 52nd Street and 5th Avenue, if, you, uh, if you've been to New York City or know the area. It actually is the headquarters, the world headquarters of Cartier, and that story about trading the pearls is, is not apocryphal. It did happen, although there was a little bit more complicated than that, that it was a time also when a lot of the wealthy people were moving further uptown. Uh, so Morton first started to make a name for himself as a yachtsman. 
Um, that's really how people kind of got to know him. The public got to know him. He loved yachts and yachting, and he, he got his first boat when he was just 13 years old. Um, and he was introduced to the area of Connecticut where I live, primarily by boat. He also um, was very familiar with the waters down here in the Gulf of Mexico. He did a lot of sailing here. His father, his father's steamship lines went, as you probably know, from Tampa to Havana and then all the way north to Canada. Um, so he was really familiar with all of the waters um, in the uh, Atlantic. Morton was especially drawn to New London, Connecticut, um, because it was still somewhat isolated and a little bit off the beaten path. Um, this is a picture depicting the, the downtown kind of transportation hub in New London where a lot of the uh, steamboats would come in, uh, the railroads, the trolley lines. Um, Morton did have a hand in a lot of those different transportation uh, uh, companies. Uh, but the water that you see on the left is a river. Uh, and Morton actually ran a, a boat that regularly went across the river, bringing people from the railroad station across the river to a more rural, kind of a little bit more remote town called Groton, uh, where he had his, um, his house and a, um, a summer resort. The biggest boat in this uh, postcard depiction of the Yale Harvard boat race is, uh, is one of Plant's yachts. Um, he owned uh, many boats, as I mentioned, uh, some of which were called the Parthenia, the Venetia, which I'm pretty sure this is of the Venetia. It was a steam yacht. Um, the Shimna, the Kanawaha, Thelma, Elena, Venatis, Nelly, and Maisie, which were both <coughs> named after two of his three, three wives. He, uh, <laughs> he, yeah, the first one didn't get one named after. Um, so he was a big supporter of the Yale Harvard race. He loved Yale University. Uh, well, at that point it was Yale College, and he actually did donate quite a bit of, of land and money to Yale through the years, um, even though he never went to college. But it probably was because he spent a lot of time as a child with both sets of grandparents, one of whom was in Brantford and one of which was in New Haven, Connecticut. So he knew the New Haven, Connecticut connection and um, how important Yale was to Connecticut. And so he always had a great love for Yale. Uh, he ended up, uh, he, he regularly entertained the Yale team when they came to do their uh, practice before the big regatta. And he then took a lot of his own guests and his own friends to watch the race. And uh, he also gave the Yale team money uh, and land on which they built their boat house, which still exists today. Usable? What's that? Is it usable? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they still use it. Absolutely. <laughs> Yep, every spring they all converge on the two, the Yale Harvard boathouses. They each have one there. And, uh, and uh, it's not, it, the, the event though is nowhere near as big as it was in the early 1900s. Uh, so besides um, owning yachts, he was as I, a big yachtsman. He was big in the yachting world, as were a lot of the industrialists of that era. Uh, he, he was, Part of the New York Yacht Club and the Larchmont Yacht Club, which are two of the oldest yacht clubs uh, up in the New York area. Uh, he was the head of the New York Yacht Club's New London uh, satellite office. And so this is a depiction of those, what that looked like. It was pretty small. Um, but this little building still exists, although not in New London, when the New York Yacht Club 
kind of close down some of their satellites. They, I'm told that this building was floated <coughs> on, New York, on uh, Long Island Sound and then the Atlantic Ocean to Newport, Rhode Island, where it still is. <coughs> so this is a picture of Morton and his second wife, Nellie. Nellie was the wife that he was married to the longest. She was um, from Baltimore, and she was the daughter of uh, another industrialist family. Um, her maiden name was Capron, and her father owned and, and ran some textile mills in the Baltimore area. Um, I love this picture, though, of the two of them because you can see how at home Morton looks on the water um, and how um, Nellie doesn't look so delighted. <laughs> uh, Nellie was apparently uh, said to get seasick very easily, so she often did not accompany Morton on his longer voyages and wasn't too thrilled about being out on the water in general, uh, which was a little bit of a disappointment to, to Morton. You can see in some of his writings, although um, most of what he wrote was very neutrally toned, so it's hard to get any emotion at all. This is a picture of Yolanda. Yolanda was uh, Morton's uh, largest and uh, kind of most interesting yacht. Um, he, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, he took a nine-month trip on this boat. It was built in, um, in Scotland. He had it commissioned and built in Scotland. He left New London in October of 1909 on Yolanda uh, for an, what became a nine-month trip that he wrote a journal that was later published in a, a little book that you can see in different places. Uh, some libraries have it, and there's actually a copy of it in the new um, Bellevue. Um, and it was, at the time, it was the third largest steam yacht of its day and the second largest privately owned yacht. It was longer than a football field. It carried 400 tons of coal. And it cost a million dollars to build, which today would be about $24 million. Uh, although Morton tended to uh, shun the limelight for the most part, uh, there was something about this boat that he really was, um, he kind of got on the PR circuit about. And so he celebrated its launch, for example, by hosting a luncheon in one of the smokestacks. And in 1908, the New York Herald um, published an article about the, the yacht that showed a six-cylinder automobile driving through one of the 55-foot-long smokestacks turned on its side. Uh, there were, uh, it could carry 520 people. And um, it cost about $1,000 a day to operate, which today would be about $25,000. Uh, the crew began work at 5 a.m. They worked 12-hour shifts. Um, half could go ashore at the various ports. So that's where they got the benefits. Um, they, they got to see places in Europe and Asia and the Middle uh, Middle East that um, few people, few Americans were, were seeing. Uh, at the time, the US, aver average U.S. salary was between $200 to $400 annually, and most of the crew made at least uh, about the $400 range, uh, but many made, as I said, up to 10 times that. So it was probably considered a very good gig for the for the people that worked, the crew members that worked on the boat. Oh, and the boat, this is another view of the Yolanda, it's a painting that's still in the family. Um, <clears throat> an interesting thing about, about what happened to Yolanda was after Morton sold the boat, uh, it was sold to the Empress of um, Russia. And uh, the same person who captained the boat for Morton, 
worked for her. Uh, during World War I, it, it sailed into German waters, and it was going to be um, taken control of by the Germans. Charlie Barr, who was aboard the, who was at the helm, was able to escape the Germans and got it back into British water. Um, but the concession was that he had to let the British take control over it. So it became a uh, British uh, military ship and then later was uh, actually scrapped. This is another of, of Morton's boats. Um, this is the Ingemar. And uh, as you can see, the Ingemar was a, sail, a sailing, a racing uh, sailboat. And it was a 127-foot schooner. It won 21 prizes in 25 races. This was designed by the Harishoff uh, Boatyard that maybe you've heard of. It was a, uh, it's a very famous uh, boatyard from Bristol, Rhode Island, and uh, made, uh, designed and built an awful lot of the early America's Cup um, uh, ra uh, racing boats. And in 1903, Plant ordered four yachts from Harishoff that cost a total of $94,000. Um, one of the interesting stories about Ingemar is that it was, um, Morton brought it to Keel Week to race, and it, uh, in 1904, it was racing against the Kaiser's boat, Meteor 3. And uh, at one point, the two boats were battling for position uh, for supremacy in this race. Um, rules of, of yachting was calling for the Meteor to give way. And it wasn't. Um, the Kaiser's boat was not giving way. The uh, crew of the Ingemar were sweating this out and trying to decide whether they should break the rules of yachting and, uh, and give way to the Kaiser or whether they should continue to risk um, drowning the Kaiser. And <laughs> they decided to hold fast uh, to the rules of the race. And with about three feet to spare, so the story goes, uh, Meteor 3 gave way. And Morton, who, unlike many of the wealthy yachtsmen of his time, actually played a role on the boats. He sailed on the boats. Um, and was a part an active participant. He didn't just sit on the docks. Um, he was said to be standing on Ingemar um, in a hatchway with his head kind of sticking up, with his cigar clamped in his mouth and, and his straw boater hat on. And he said to um, Charlie Barr, uh, good man, Charlie, I give way to no one. Um, after he made the decision to not give way to the, to the Kaiser. And the Kaiser was said to come over later on to the um, Ingemar's dock and apologize for their behavior on the water. So this is one of the trophies that um, Ingemar won. It's, uh, it's in the family's collection, and each of these little musicians uh, the head comes off and they become little drinking cups. <laughs> and uh, the yachtsmen were, were big drinkers, so I'm sure it got put to good use. Uh, so yachting was a huge thing at this time, which kind of was surprising to me. Uh, all of the, the papers covered yachting. It, what, they covered all of the pageantry of it, the racing. Um, and this is a, a, um, a full page in one of the New York papers showing the, the yachtsmen, the famous yachtsmen of the time. Morton Plant is in the bottom row, the second from the right. Um, and he's shown holding um, Ingemar, a, a model of Ingemar, Yolanda, and um, some of his trophies. Besides uh, yachting, like his father, Morton had a pivotal role in transportation issues of the day. So this was the, 
the tech explosion of the time. This is the early 1900s, um, you know, 1905 to 1915 or so. And uh, Morton became involved in all of these. He certainly uh, took control uh, over his father's railroad and express companies, which Henry had set up. But in addition to that, he became involved in owning trolley lines. He ran um, a trolley line that uh, uh, went across all of Connecticut. Um, he owned uh, lines down here in Pinellas and Hillsborough counties. Um, he invested in uh, roads. He paid to pave roads. So he paved roads down here. He paved roads in Connecticut, which was a big, it seems like that's not a big deal, but it was a big deal back then. There was no paved roads. And as automobiles were coming into the, onto the scene, um, people were having an awful hard time to get from place to place because there was no real roads. Um, he um, invested in canals. He invested in the Cape Cod Canal. He was a prime investor in the New York City subway system. And interestingly, to me at least, uh, was he also saw a lot of promise in the future of air travel. And he invested in the Wright Brothers Company. I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with this building, which was his father's um, uh, Tampa Bay Hotel and is now part of the University of Tampa and where the Henry Plant Museum is located. Um, and so another, par another aspect of the business world that Morton became involved with was something he learned from his father, and that was to put these destination hotels and resorts in places to get people to ride his railroads and his trolleys. And uh, so this was his father's big uh, pride and joy, which also which became kind of a white elephant and was never as successful as Henry had hoped. But it's um, uh, still a really interesting story. Um, you know, it was it hosted a lot of uh, the liter you know literati of the day. Um, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders camped out on the grounds there and went off to, uh, to fight in the Spanish-American War from there. Um, you know, later after Henry's death, it, it hosted a lot of celebrities. Uh, Babe Ruth w stayed there and was said to have hit some particularly long um, hit, baseball hit there. Um, but uh, so this was one of the places where more and learned kind of about the resort trade. This uh, is the Bellevue, which um, most of you are probably familiar with. And uh, so Morton was really put in charge of running this, uh, this resort by his father. So it was built in 1897. His father was still alive at that time. But this was kind of Morton's baby. And I just had uh, the, the privilege of going into the new Bellevue Inn. If you haven't gone in there yet, it was great. And Christopher Still and Kelly Still, whose beautiful paintings are here on the walls, um, uh, showed me around over there. And it's just gorgeous and really nicely, uh, nice historic um, detail over there. And there's all kinds of of um, paintings and uh, information about both Henry and Morton there, which is really interesting. Uh, so Morton was running this, this resort. He was really the first person who start, developed a golf course in Florida. Um, it was thought at the time that, um, that golfing, that you could not sustain a golf course in Florida. Um, and so Morton actually brought in train loads of topsoil from Indiana and brought it down and developed the course at the Bellevue. Morton kept a, um, a crew of employees at the, who came down and worked at the Bellevue during the winter months 
when that hotel was, was at its peak of operations, and then they, they closed down in the summer. And then everybody went up north to this other plant resort, which is, was located in Groton, Connecticut. The slide says New London, Connecticut, but that's always, it, they always, um, it's kind of a long story, but that's, it's always uh, misidentified. But it was in Groton. Uh, the Griswold Hotel, and there was an earlier smaller hotel on this site. Morton was very drawn to this area because it had a lot of open land, and Morton was interested in developing model farms, um, so he wanted the land, but he also uh, loved the water, so he wanted the water as well. And he bought the older hotel, and when it closed down on Labor Day, he started have it working on having it uh, demolished. And by the next um, June, 1st of June, this had been built and um, opened. It uh, had 150 rooms. And again, even though it was um, obviously a kind of playground for the, for the wealthy, or at least the upper middle class, and wealthier people in the area. It also allowed um, people in that area to have the kind of jobs that really didn't exist. And I think the Bellevue in the same way. They didn't otherwise exist. So there was, he kept, for example, physicians on staff, and nurses, and, and uh, classical musicians, and um, uh, you know, people that ran the boats. He kept people, um, automobile mechanics, and chauffeurs, and the top chefs. So those people would no not have really found um, much of a niche uh, in, uh, in New London and Groton, Connecticut, or probably in uh, Clearwater, Florida at that time. This was Morton's summer home. <laughs> <laughs> it was called, it's called Branford House. It, the building is still there. Um, it was largely designed by his second wife, Nellie. She was a very educated woman and she always had an interest in architecture. Um, it was, it uh, was do completed in 1903. And in addition to the house, it was known for its elaborate gardens and a uh, flower conservatory and where he, they grew exotic fruit and they had oranges in the winter, which was unheard of in the Northeast at that time. Um, they grew orchids and uh, so it was quite a showcase, um, quite the talk of the area. Um, but they only really spent a couple of months a year there. This is uh, how part the building looks today. It actually is part of the University of Connecticut. Um, our southeastern Connecticut uh, branch campus is located there. And the, uh, the director of that campus, her, her office is like to die for. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's I think it was Nellie's bedroom or something. It was, it's got the most gorgeous view. Um, the, the, um, Lighthouse was not there when Morton was there, but that little island out in the uh, Fisher's Island Sound is uh, also was owned by Morton, and that's kind of interesting because there was a fertilizer plant on the island when Morton bought this peninsula, and Morton didn't really like the smell, as you can imagine, <laughs> um, so he bought it and uh, got rid of the fertilizer plant. And then he, it was a place where his, uh, much later uh, after his death, his granddaughters used to uh, play out there. And um, he kept some sheep out there sometimes. So this is, uh, the, the Bramford House is still used as, a, as an event venue. And uh, this is, this is um, one of the, how it, it's kind of hard to see, but it's from these hand-colored photographs that were taken by the architect and are in the University of Connecticut's collection. Um, very elaborate, a lot of heavy tapestries, dark paneling.
uh, very you know, typical of the wealthy of that time. Um, this is uh, what a lot of, uh, of the area was known for and, and plant was known for was the keeping of these big greenhouses and this model farm on the, on the property there. Um, this is the construction of Branford House. He uh, brought in, um, he used uh, all the local stone. It was just like, it's this peninsula, it's this big rocky peninsula. And they quarried a lot of the granite right from the site to use in the house construction. But Morton brought over a group of Italian artisans Italian stone cutters, and it was really the first group of Italians that came into that area. They camped out on the site while they were constructing the house, and it's not really certain how much interaction Morton had with the workers, but there is evidence that he really respected what they did because he did give land to establish the first Catholic church in that town. Um, and that was largely an homage to his Italian workers. Morton also owned his, his model farms extended for thousands of acres, actually. And uh, now part of that land is uh, a small regional airport. So that's what this is. And uh, he also owned 3,000 acres of land that he was some uh, very interested, be mostly because of a friend who got him interested in the idea of land conservation and wildlife preservation. In the early 1900s, a lot of native species in Connecticut were being wiped out because of, of overhunting and lack of regulation and, and somewhat because of development. And so there was a recognition that you were going to have to start maybe doing some preservation. And so Morton bought 3,000 acres of land in, um, in another town in, uh, along the shoreline um, for a land um, a wildlife preserve. And that land is now Stones Ranch Military Reservation. It's where um, the National Guard uh, trains. Um, this is a, um, a full page article about Morton Plant's uh, model farms. And Morton was regularly referred to by reporters of the time as the wealthiest man in Connecticut. Whether that was the case or not, I don't know. I mean, things were always embellished. And I don't embellish anything as a journalist, but <laughs> but people do. Um, <laughs> this was uh, Morton's hunting lodge, which was on that property. And he would take his buddies over there, uh, and they would stay on the land. And, and then they'd go fishing and hunting. And that, again, was something he learned from Henry, who, who did that at the Tampa Bay resort. This, this house still exists. It's now privately owned. Morton's biggest contribution, or one of his biggest contributions, I think, was to education. And I think that it really was uh, spurred by his wife, Nellie. And I think it's kind of sad that she doesn't get much, much notice, because I really think it was her who pushed him to get involved. There was, at that time, um, there was no college in Connecticut where women could earn a baccalaureate degree. And so there was this great contest to establish a women's college in Connecticut. Um, a lot of towns in Connecticut competed for this favor. New London won. Um, there was a lot of community support. Morton was asked to be the head of the Board of Trustees, and he agreed. Um, so Although they had been given land and they had gotten a lot of money donated by townspeople and business people in the area, there still was not enough money to keep the college running, to actually get it up and running, hire people, pay people, pay teachers, um, that kind of thing. And so 
they had, you know, boards of trustees meetings that went for hours and hours where they would continually uh, kind of debate how are we going to get this thing going and where is the money going to come from. And one day, Morton was overseeing a board of trustees meeting. It was a day when his, his baseball team, the Planters, were going to be playing in New London. He made a point to try to always go see them play when he was, he was there and they were playing locally. Uh, minor league baseball was a much bigger thing back then. And so, you know, this meeting was going on and on and on, and he was, he was kind of not a very patient man. Finally, he said, look, um, this debate seems to be going on and on. If I just say, I'll give you a million dollars, can we end this debate and get the college going? And they said, yeah. <laughs> I think so. And he said, great. And he went to his baseball game. <laughs> and uh, so his donations to the college went beyond the million dollars. He also gave them money to establish two of the first three buildings on campus, which was two dormitories named in honor of his parents, Plant Hall and Blackstone Hall. And then he also gave money in his will. This is how Connecticut College looked when it was being built. It was kind of a forlorn looking place. Uh, this is how it looks now. Um, this, uh, this is probably uh, closer to something to your uh, neck of the woods here, um, although you may not be so familiar with how, the, how it looked at that time. This was how Morton Plant Hospital looked when it first opened. And uh, the story goes was that his son, Henry, who was his only son, his only biological son, uh, he also had an adoptive son, um, ha had an accident. Henry actually had quite a few accidents. Um, he, he apparently was uh, imbibed a little too much. Um, but on this particular occasion, it apparently was pretty serious. Uh, he was uh, there. Morton didn't think there was the greatest health care in this area at the time, and so he brought some doctors down from Chicago, um, and uh, they the railroad went right up to the door of the Bellevue, and so he had the railroad cars park there, stay on site, and nurse uh, the nurses and doctors, nurse Henry back to health. But the people in this area saw an opportunity at that point to convince Mor Morton that he should help them establish a hospital. So there had already been a lot of interest in that. And uh, so they went to him and he said yes, he would give a certain amount of money if they also collected a certain amount of money fr locally. And they did and uh, this is what it looked like when it opened. And now, of course, you know what it looks like today. And what year did it open? Uh, I don't remember exactly what year, but. Their 100th anniversary. About that's right. Ago. Yeah, so it was uh, 15, like. Uh, 1915. OK, it was just, it wasn't too long before he died, actually. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, did he really have that much influence? Because most of what he did was for his own benefit. And certainly, he had a lot of fun with his dad's money, for the most part. Um, but he, he did do a lot of things. A lot of what he did improved the lives of people in the areas where he lived. So. I kind of don't really think that it's, it's important what his, his motivations were. Um, they could have been selfish, or they could have been more like Andrew Carnegie, who thought that he really had a responsibility. Um, but the, the bottom line was that much of his land and much of what he donated is still benefiting people 100 years after his death. He died in the um, flu epidemic of 1918. 
and he was only about 67 at that time. <coughs> So I like this picture of Morton because it's one of the few where he's, I've ever seen him smile. Usually it's very formal. Um, but Morton Plant wasn't the wealthiest man of his era. He didn't make as hefty donations as the likes of Andrew Carnegie. Uh, he wasn't as well known as John Rockefeller. Uh, but because he settled, in areas that were somewhat more remote at the time. He, and because he was forward thinking and invested in emerging technologies such as automobiles and airplanes, and he gave to humble causes as well, such as churches and grander causes like uh, uh, hospitals, land conservation, a women's college, he leaves an important and significant legacy still. So, I just gave you kind of a highlight of, of him and his contributions. Um, there's a lot more in my book, and I'd be uh, happy to uh, have you buy one, <laughs> certainly. Um, it's also available on Amazon if you, uh, if you want to look at it there. But I do have some copies here. And I also would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Morton died about age 67. About, his father yep. was 86. I understand his son was 46. Uh -huh. And went off to leave an unknown kind of life. I think he died in Miami. He did. Uh, but I guess he just never made it. He was, uh, and that adopted son, they were parent and pair. And I heard that the son always got the youngest Morton in trouble. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, the younger Morton ended up living and dying in the Miami area. You know anything about him? Yes, I do. Uh, so his son was actually named Henry. Uh, it was Henry Plant, so he was named after his grandfather. And uh, he was... Um, he was a business person, but he also was, uh, had a lot of personal problems. Mm -hmm. He was a heavy drinker. He liked to party. He um, was often in the company of women who were not his wife. <laughs> um, he, he actually died on a boat off the coast of Miami um, and supposedly in the arms of a lover. Mm -hmm. oh. Uh, other than that, he, yes, you're right, he died about age 40. He, um, he was just, he was not very healthy most of his life. There was a lot of records of him being in the hospital for various accidents he was in or illnesses that he had. Um, and then he was, had lived a really hard drinking, hard living kind of lifestyle. So uh, you're right, he was, he did not distinguish himself up very much. Um, and he, he is buried up in New London, uh, Connecticut, in the same place where Morton is. So his adoptive son was Philip Plant. And Phil, uh, the, most, the most interesting marriage that uh, Morton had was his third marriage to a woman named Maisie. And she was about um, uh, half his age. And she went on to be married uh, three more times after his death. Um, no, two times after his death. Morton was her second marriage. And uh, she insisted that Morton adopt Philip, who was her son. And um, Philip also had that kind of lifestyle, was a playboy. Was, had um, some scandals that involved um, his cavorting with um, early like silent film stars and and that kind of thing, and he also died when he was only about forty one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was he divorced or did his wives die? So his first wife uh, was a very short um, relationship that he had with a, a a young socialite from Northampton, Massachusetts, and they were only married for about a year. She did not die, but I could not find any divorce documentation either. 
but I think that they either had a annulment or they or they got divorced and she remarried. Um, there's really almost nothing. It's uh, it's pretty much like that person never existed in his life because his second wife Nellie is always almost always referred to erroneously as his first wife. He was married to Nellie the longest. There's much evidence that she was kind of the love of his life, even though he had extramarital affairs. And um, then Maisie. What happened to Nellie? Nellie died of typhoid uh, in 1913. And, and then within a year, he married Maisie, who looked a lot like Nellie. <laughs> Any, th any other questions? Yeah. What's the status of the family now? So there still are uh, descendants of the family. Um, there are two uh, great granddaughters, and then they have children. Uh, one of the great granddaughters actually helped me in my research and provided me with some of the photographs that are in the book. Um, and they live in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and I believe the other great-granddaughter lives on the West Coast in California someplace, but I don't know exactly what town. And is there still a business empire they run, or is it pretty well? Well, you know, I'm often asked whether they, the, any of that wealth got handed down. Um, and I, I know that it, probably a certain amount of it did, but to tell you the truth, even though when Morton died, um, he had a, a big estate, but he also had a big pot of debt. <laughs> and he, I mean, there were, th there were a lot of things that were uh, particularly lavish. I mean, he had a whole cellar full of, of expensive wine and champagne that was worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. But a lot of a lot of what he had he invested in a lot of local companies that were not good investments uh, his trolley line was uh, always uh, in debt and went under very shortly after his death um, so a lot of the money started to really get dwindled down there was a big tax dispute after his death that resulted in that land in, uh, in East Lyme that was the conservation area, that being um, forfeited by the family and uh, over to the state. Um, and his estate in Groton, where the Bramford House was, actually when, it, when Henry died, when his son Henry died, it, his widow came back into the picture and wanted that land back. And so there was another dispute, and uh, the, the survivors were counseled by lawyers at the time to kind of give it up and just put it on the auction block. And when it was auctioned, which was at the end of the Great Depression, it was considered a white elephant. And the state bought it for you know fire sale prices. I was always a little bit suspicious of that, but... <laughs> But they did get it. And so I think that a lot of what the, f the descendants have now is, is kind of what they made and, and less handed down from the plant fortune. <clears throat> the picture you showed of the first Martin Plant Hospital, yes. that building is still there, isn't it? There's a building up there that looks very much like that picture. You know, I don't know. The hospital provided that photo to me, and I know that they had their anniversary, and I talked with them, but it was not ever clear to me about that, the actual building there. Any other questions? All right. Well. I'll be here for a while. Again, I have some books over here, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions personally. And again, thank you for coming.